All right, thank you so much for uh, staying for the last talk. Um, I'm going to talk about waveform estimation detection and noise spectroscopy. Uh, but first, I need to do some shameless self-promotion. Uh, I'd just like to mention that our main research activity in the past few years have been uh, super resolution. Uh, the application of quantum metrology ideas to just passive optical imaging with incoherent sources, a lot of good re results as well as a lot of experimental demonstrations by other groups. I gave a talk at the beginning of the program about this. Uh, it's recorded, please take a look if you haven't. You can fast forward if you want. It's quite a long talk, but uh, uh, let, me, let me know what you think. Another thing I want to mention is, is this idea of using electro-optics, electro-optic modulator, uh, to do quantum transduction, coupling microwave signals to optical uh, signals. I gave a talk at uh, Jilla, actually, uh, around 2010, 2011. I think I met James, I met uh, June, talked about this as a theoretical proposal. And I just like to report that after so many years, uh, people have done experiments uh, in recent years. Many groups have been trying to do this. It's become an active topic, so that's another another topic I like to self-promote. But anyway, the main topic today is about sensing with a dynamical system. Okay. In practice, of course, you look at LIGO, look at optomechanics, look at magnetometry. The signal you are interested in is not a scalar number. It's changing in time, in time domain. That's what we call a waveform. It's a time varying parameter, basically. That's what we really need to assume in practice. It's coupled to some uh, continuous input field and some dynamical system. Could be a mechanical oscillator, it could be a atomic spin ensembles, and then you do a continuous measurement of the optical field. It's not just one mode, but over many optical modes, usually. I'm going to focus on this, this type of Hamiltonian, where there's a linear coupling of the unknown waveform to the quantum system. For example, you're looking at optomechanics, then you have a classical force, classical gravitational wave. The generator in the Hamiltonian is the mechanical position or the relative position of two mirrors, uh, you do homodyne measurement continuously. Another example I'm going to talk about is optical phase estimation or optical interferometers in general. Then you're just focusing on the optics, not uh, you forget about the mechanics, you just focus on the optics, then there's a phase modulation on some continuous optical beam. The generator is the photon flux operator, and then you do heterodyne, homodyne, etc. You can also think about applying the theory I'm go going to talk about to atomic systems. Then you have a stochastic or time-varying magnetic field, you have the atomic spin operator, and then you still do optical measurements. But this is a topic I'm not going to talk too much about, or I'm not going to talk about it at all, because I'm not familiar with it. I'm just going to f focus on these two. What can we do as a theorist? Well, the first thing we can do is to go to Hellstrom's book and do some calculations uh, regarding uh, quantum estimation and detection theory, calculating the quantum limits for any measurement. Uh, basically, almost everything has been done in Hellstrom's book. The next question you can ask is, okay, I've got the fundamental quantum limit. How do you do the best measurement? So for optomechanics, there are a lot of questions. Do you do homodyne? Do you do, do photon counting? Do you need to worry about bad action noise? Uh, and, uh, and because we are measuring the optical field, you also have to worry about which optical mode you are measuring. So that that's, can be an important point uh, in certain applications. And last but not the least, you also have to worry about the best data processing. You have a noisy time series coming out of your experiment. It's not just one measurement. It's not a POVM, it's noisy data. You have to do classical statistics to uh, clean up the signal, to, so to speak. Then you can ask, do I do maximum likelihood, Bayesian filtering, smoothing, likelihood ratio tests? So all these problems are important. 
So once you've solved these problems, you can also ask more ambitious questions. How do you optimize the input state? How do you optimize the dynamics? We've talked a lot about these problems in the conference, but I'm just going to focus on the first three problems. Okay, so uh, because this is a talk, uh, the, the last talk of the conference, I'll just try to minimize the technical details. Just going to talk about two specific problems. Estimating the unknown waveform and also estimating some parameters of the power spectral density, assuming that this waveform is a stationary stochastic process, okay? So I'm going to focus on these two problems. I'm just going to skip uh, problem three. Okay, all right, so waveform estimation. The first thing you need to realize is that this is changing, a parameter that is changing in time. There are actually many, many parameters. It's changing all the time, right? At each time, is the, the parameter is changing to a different value. So there are many, many, many par parameters. And you could even argue that it's infinitely many parameters, okay? Now, all the techniques you know and love in quantum metrology and basic quantum metrology don't really work that well anymore because a lot of these techniques as Augusto has talked about earlier, they rely on the syntactics. They assume that you have many observations, but they are all conditioned on the same static parameter. Does it work for waveform? It's changing all the time. And also, if you look at LIGO, you cannot expect the exact same gravitational wave to keep arriving, right? So the syntactics don't work anymore. Well, let's look at what people do in classical statistics since the Second World War. If, uh, if you're a Russian, then you realize that even before the Second World War, for example, for radar, for uh, analog communication, the solution to this problem is to assume that X of T is a random process. And then you do Bayesian estimation. Mean square error. We are going to do another expectation, not just expectation over the random observations, but expectation over some prior for your random process. So we are averaging the mean square error over some prior. So we are looking at the average performance of your detector, not just the error given some waveform. That is quite meaningless in this problem. Model is as a random process look at the average performance, do Bayesian estimation, basically. Uh, another option, well, one option would be you follow Augusto. Uh, another option that people do in classical statistics is to you go to minimax. You look at the worst case error, uh, but uh, you can try that, but uh, after a few days, you come back crying and say, okay, that's too difficult. Minimax statistics, you look at worst case error, is basically just done by mathematicians pretending to be uh, applied scientists. <laughs> so uh, Bayesian is good enough. I'm going to follow Komarov. I'm going to follow Wiener. And you know, these people really know what they're talking about. OK, uh, now we want to include uh, quantum mechanics into the problem. Uh, Aria gave a nice introduction at the program. It's recorded about continuous measurements, so you should take a look. You can model continuous measurements using the standard theory, open quantum system theory, CP maps, uh, Lindblad, Klaus, uh, Krauss operators, all that. That's one way, go to uh, the, the open quantum system theory. But another way that is much easier for us if we want to calculate all these quantum bounds is to go to the church, so to speak, in, in, in theory, theorist language. Go to the church of the larger Hubert space include everything that is relevant to the sensor, to the dynamical system. So include, include all the degrees of freedom, include the light, include the mechanics, include the environment. Then uh, if your Hubert space is large enough, you can assume that the initial state is pure. And then you can also assume that any dynamics, including the, the, the coupling of the waveform to the system, interaction between optics and mechanics and any coupling to the environment using just unitary evolution, okay? That's what the church says, right? 
you don't have to use open quantum system theory. Pure state unitary evolution, that's fine. And last but not the least, even though you are doing continuous measurements or a sequence of measurements in reality, you can use this so-called principle of different measurement to assume that the measurement statistics can be reproduced by one final measurement at the final time. So now we just have a quantum state condition on the waveform. Uh, we have a final measurement in terms of a POVM, and then we can start to apply all the Hellstrom's uh, theory to the problem, and then we can derive the bound. Okay, so what we tried many years ago now is to calculate a Bayesian quantum bound in the sense of assuming the waveform is random, we want to ask, uh, give a, a lower quantum bound on the average mean square error. Okay, we still have to make some assumptions, tasteful assumptions, so that the final result is simple but not too simple. Simple in the sense that we have a closed form solution, not too simple in the sense that it still contains some essential insights about the dynamics of the system. Anyway, this is just an equation. Uh, you can compare it with the vanilla quantum Kramer outbound that people keep talking about. Um, uh, compare the two expressions, then you see there, there are similarities. So for the quantum Kramer outbound, the usual one, you have the inverse of the variance of the generator. In this case, we have the power spectral density of the generator in the Heisenberg picture. Okay. So again, for example, in optomechanics, that's the power spectral density of the mechanical position. If you're doing optical phase estimation, it's the power spectral density of the photon flux. There's another term here, is the prior information, because we are doing Bayesian. We assume that we have some prior probability measure for the pro uh, random process. So that is some prior information that you also have to take into account. Okay, so this is, again, the last talk, so I don't want to talk about the math, so I'll just talk about the physics. Okay, so we've got this result, uh, very nice. Actually, um, I did this when I was a postdoc in Carl Cave's group, and when I first joined, he gave me this problem. He said, okay, this is, uh, I, this is an important problem that he tried, he couldn't do it, it's difficult, and maybe you can try. So it took me six months, and I didn't spend the whole six months doing calculations. It's just that in the first five months, I thought, okay, the problem, he said it's difficult. So I didn't, tr I didn't even start to try, I just do other things, and then Eventually, I thought, okay, all right, maybe I'll give it a try, and it turns out I'm smart. <laughs> okay, anyway, so we got the results, but now you have to ask what would be the, the measurement that, that, and data processing that, that achieve it, right? Uh, let's assume coherent state, a coherent optical beam, uh, or squeeze light going into your LIGO or interferometer. Uh, what do you need to do to achieve this fundamental quantum limit? In the context of optomechanics, uh, the first thing you need to do is to remove any back action noise, okay, in the form of radiation pressure noise or ponderomotive squeezing. You have to remove it, or maybe it's negligible, so you don't need to care about it. There used to be a debate, I think, in the 70s and 80s about whether this noise is fundamental or not, but, but eventually people realized that it can be removed. I do have some papers on it, but our, my main contribution is just to introduce more jargons to the field to annoy people. So anyway, I don't want to talk about this too much, but let's assume that we, we can do this, okay? We, we remove the back, measurement back action noise through quantum noise cancellation, through you know, frequency, detune, uh, fr frequency dependent squeezing, and I think LIGO people are doing that now, right? So let's assume that we can do that, remove uh, measurement back action noise. Then the measurement becomes a lot simpler. Just do homodyne measurement at the output. Measure the phase quadrature at the dark port of the Michelson interferometer. That's exactly what LIGO people have been doing. You get a noisy signal in time domain. It's just the signal convolved with some impulse response function plus some additive, white Gaussian, additive Gaussian noise. Last but not the least, you need to do data processing. Ah. Clemens is here, I want to mention that Clemens has done work on uh, back action evasion and all that, even before us. So I do get a few extra minutes. Okay. 
So as uh, classical data processing, uh, well, we know that we are doing Bayesian, right? Uh, we know that minimum mean square error estimator is just calculating the conditional expectation of the waveform, conditioned on the observation. And in engineering literature, this is just called smoothing because you're dealing with noisy time series. We know what the mean square error after all that. There's an analytic expression. You can compare it with the quantum bound here. And then you see that, okay, there's a fundamental limit to the noise floor. But assuming that you do everything perfectly, then you get an equal sign here. Then you achieve the fundamental quantum limit, okay? So smoothing, that's just a classical concept. For linear Gaussian systems, optical mechanics, LIGO, uh, that sort of theory has been done by Komogorov, Wiener, and many people in, the, in classical statistics and engineering. Somehow, for some strange reason, smoothing, the idea of smoothing, I think Aria mentioned this, the idea of smoothing is very controversial in the quantum case. I don't understand why. Uh, but uh, Klaus Momer has an early paper applying this sort of linear Gaussian system theory to, to magnetometry. So now I get even more minutes. Uh, and, and I did the general quantum theory. But again, I don't have time to talk about it. But okay, so the, the picture is clear, right? Remove all the measurement by action noise, homodyne measurement, smoothing, data processing, that gives you the optimal result. We uh, managed to convince Eleanor Huntington's group and Akila Fulusawa's group to do a very proof of concept experiment to demonstrate the basic ideas. It's nowhere close to LIGO. I mean, if LIGO people want to do this, they could, but you know, they have better things to do. Uh, so it's just demonstrating estimation close to the quantum Kramer outbound. They have an optical probe, continuous optical beam, reflected by some classical mirror, so we don't need to worry about measurement by action and all that, it's just classical mirror. Measure the light using homodyne measurement, using homodyne measurement, adaptive homodyne measurement in practice, apply estimator to it, uh, this is the smooth thing. And then you can estimate the position, momentum, and force on the mirror. The force on the mirror in that their experiment is something they apply, some sort of OU, Einstein, Ullenbeck process. So, they know what the force is, they know what it's applying, uh, they are applying, so you can compare your estimate with the, the, the true waveform. And they got some results that are pretty close to the mean, mean square error, okay? Around 30%. You know, this sort of experiment, again, proof of concept, but you know, Aquila's group can do it before breakfast, so that, that's what they did. Just also want to mention that, that, uh, uh, Yan Hong's group has done, uh, apply similar ideas. Well, they call it by something else, but, but it's the same as smooth thing for spin squeezing and also magnetometry, more recently, I would say. Okay. Okay, so far so good. Any questions so far? Just hoping to leave. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I'll skip the... This is my x of t. I want to estimate this value here. So it's only at about one time. Right, but you can also estimate it at one other time. But let's think about just one time for simplicity. I want to estimate this value. This value of the random process is correlated with the random process at some other time. It's correlated with its value at the previous time. It's also correlated with its value at the future time. By measuring at this time, and also uh, by measuring at this time, I get some information that is correlated with the value at the previous time. Measuring this at this time, I get some value uh, that is correlated with this value at some intermediate time. So the best thing to do, of course, is to do the measurement of the random process over the whole time at which the random process is correlated with the value of interest. 
Does it make sense? Okay. But you know that already. <laughs> Yeah, there will be some characteristic time, and if you go too far away from the characteristic time, then your measurement is not not correlated, and then, then it does, it's not going to. Sorry. You don't gain much by doing more, right? Because more measurement is always good, right? How much better is, is the question. Okay, what um, I'm really excited to talk, talk about today is not so much waveform estimation. We did that uh, 10 years ago. There's nothing surprising. You know, you talk to the LIGO people, Hai Xing Miao, uh, Yan Bei Chen, they said, oh, we, we, we know that already. We know how homodynamics is optimal. You know, the Russians have invented something many years ago on this called this energetic quantum limit and it predicts pretty much sim very similar things. Maybe you don't need that, but I just want to emphasize the fact that the bound is somewhat heuristic. They are looking at the signal to noise ratio, but that's not the complete picture. We'll see a more dramatic example later in terms of this problem. There's now a, <clears throat> a separate problem. Again, stochastic waveform, we assume that it's stationary. It has a power spectral density, and I'm not estimating this guy anymore directly. I'm trying to estimate the parameters of its power spectral density. I still, I stole this phrase from the qubit people, right? You, you're also thinking about noise spectroscopy. You have a question, please. Well, I just wanted to clarify something because the terminology can be confusing. So, um, are you also stole the name from, there is a whole field in yeah. electrical Yep. So if I understand correctly, you are uh, estimating a parameter or maybe more parameters um, of, um, of a spectral density, which is for a classical stochastic problem. Exactly. So I guess that this will be falling under what is called in your everyday like parametric um, noise estimation. Yes, this is parametric, yes. If you want to do semi-parametric, uh, we haven't done that. It's possible. I mentioned that this morning in my school there was this big idea to get out um, maybe a sampled version of the school. Um, yes, that would be called semi-parametric no estimation or non-parametric, exactly. So we have some theory about this sort of thing. We haven't just we haven't applied to this problem yet. But let's assume that you have a few parameters that you are interested in. You have a model, a good model for this guy. So examples of when you are interested in this problem, maybe you have a stochastic gravitational wave background. You are not estimating the individual gravitational wave anymore, but it's stochastic. You want to estimate its statistics, ensemble properties, or you want to test gra gravity-induced decoherence models that could also be modeled in terms of some noise on your mechanical oscillator and you're estimating some parameters. Of course, uh, you can try to look at the spectrum of some phase noise. Or atomic magnetometry, you can also think about estimating the properties of some stochastic magnetic field. Okay, so now the parameter is static again, right? Even though the waveform is changing in time, the parameters that we are interested in is actually static. So now all these ideas, maximum likelihood, kramer bound, makes sense again because it's a static parameter. Usually a symptotic theory, central limit theorem works quite well. Uh, these would be the standard textbooks and papers on this topic in classical statistics. I'm just going to focus on weak optical phase modulation. Okay, we can look at the kramer bound. We can look at the Fisher information, which is the inverse of it. The more the better. We have an upper bound on the Fisher information. It's again, assuming dynamical system and all that, uh, uh, we have an upper bound on the quantum uh, on the Fisher information for any measurement. Okay, so that's the limit. Again, it's given by some some expression. 
This is a plot assuming optical phase spectroscopy. So you have a continuous optical beam, some phase modulation that is stochastic. We try to estimate a spectrum. I'm going to assume it has a constant power spectral density in terms of the photon flux. So if you have a CW optical beam coherent state, that's what you get, flat power spectral density for the photon flux. Also going to assume that you have a flat power spectral density for the phase, just to make the problem simple. Five minutes left, okay, but people have been asking questions, so. All right, so uh, this is the punchline of the whole talk, really. It's a lot, lot plot, there's efficient information, normalized with respect to the bandwidth and the time. This is the quantum limit. This is the parameter itself, so theta squared is, is, is my height of the power spectral density, this is theta here. There's a huge gap between the quantum bound, orders of magnitude, depending on how small theta is. That's the quantum limit compared to the homodyne measurement limit. Okay, so homodyne is scales like theta squared for small theta. So the point is that if you can reach this quantum limit, you can improve things by orders of magnitude, especially for very weak signal, okay? Uh, if you have a very weak signal. So roughly speaking, this regime is the photon short noise limited regime. where your spectroscopy is limited by photon short noise. This regime is where you're limited by the signal noise. Remember, the signal is a stochastic process. It brings its own noise, so that's the signal noise limited. So whenever you have a problem that is photon short noise limited, if you can find that measurement that achieves the quantum bound, that would be uh, orders of magnitude improvement. How do you do that? We discovered it many years ago. Take the output beam of your phase modulation experiment, pass it through some diffraction grading or resonator array, so you separate different spectrum moles into different channels. And then you do photon counting. Well, it's just what people do in spectrometers, right? Just, just a spectrometer, really. So when you have phase modulation in the frequency domain, well, you see the mean field, of course, but you can remove it if you do nulling or Michelson. There's weak phase modulation, so you see symmetric sidebands. Do photon counting in the frequency domain. That gives you the optimal measurement. It's equal to the quantum Kramer outbound. Very simple. The first thing you realize, you should realize is that there's a huge gap. It's a lot, lot plot, okay? A lot, lot plot. Plot. Huge gap. Second thing you need to realize is that it cannot be explained by the Russians. Uh, by this energetic <laughs> quantum limit, the, if, you, if you think this is the end of the story, then you say, oh, homodyne can achieve the optimal uh, signal-to-noise ratio, right? That's the end of the story, but actually homodyne is not nearly the best. Okay. And uh, final thing I want to mention, Animesh has a nice paper on uh, related problems, single mode, estimating both phase and phase diffusion. But with all due respect, I think uh, it's still a huge jump uh, from, from their result to the discovery of a physical measurement that allows you to achieve the quantum limit specifically for noise spectroscopy. Okay, so we published in PRA. We didn't manage to impress the, uh, the, the high impact factor journal editors. We also get very few citations, uh, so we didn't impress the world, but uh, we managed to impress people who actually matter. Uh, the Caltech experimentalists, LIGO experimentalists, they noticed our paper, and uh, they're actually going to build an experiment to detect signatures of quantum gravity based on the idea of doing photon counting for the Michelson interferometer. So, to, so this is from their, their technical paper, Lee, Lee McCuller. So they look at the use of photon counting more carefully in the context of Michelson interferometer. Uh, Michelson, uh, they also look at stochastic noise-like signals measuring in the right modes 
and then they see that it avoids known quantum fissure information limits in signal detection. I guess that, that refers to energetic quantum limits, so that, that's very nice. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, but I'll just, instead of talking about the detailed physics, I'll just give you a very rough idea of why this is so much better. Uh, it's analogous because we are dealing with random signals and we are interested only in its statistics. We are interested in basically some kind of parameter that is its variance on average or its standard deviation on average. So it's basically very much analogous to all these studies of detection of thermal radiation where you have random fields or the detection of dark matter through a microwave cavity measurements. In both cases, you have random displacement in both quadratures, and you're just trying to detect how much energy your, your receiver is detecting. You have random displacements in both quadratures in these problems, and it's well known that if you're looking at optical astronomy, for example, photon counting is so much better than linear detectors, okay? Uh, because of uh, because because uh, the fission information, the signal-to-noise ratio is just so much better. If you're interested, I can explain more. But anyway, so it's well known when you're dealing with random signals uh, that in these two problems, photon counting is so much better than just doing heterodyne or homodyne detection. For us, we are looking at phase noise spectroscopy. It's a coherent input. Uh, there's random displacement of just one quadrature, the optical phase quadrature, but it turns out that the statistics is similar. You can also look at incoherent imaging. There's the random fuse, there's randomly displaced photons, and you, again, you see the same kind of uh, physics going on. And uh, well, finally, if you use squeezing at the input, uh, you just use uh, unsqueezing at the output. That turns out to be optimal. And then you do spectral photon counting. Okay, all right, so uh, running out of time. I do have some big picture ideas to talk about, but let me stop here and reach the conclusion and let you read it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to first say I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, all the uh, data processing and tools from signal analysis, signal processing as well. However, um, in modeling um, spectral densities as like uh, uh, described here, um, there is a physically the implicit assumption that uh, the fluctuation is describable by a random stochastic field, which doesn't capture, um, you know, um, quantum noise, uh, which could be spectrally asymmetric. Is there a way to go beyond this type of, um, you know, without, sure. of course, if you assume that uh, uh, the fluctuation comes from an environment which obeys, uh, you know, fluctuation dissipation relationship, so it's already in equilibrium, you could say, the symmetrized is related to the anti-symmetrized and therefore I get everything. But there could be potentially interesting environments and the optomechanics Quantum gives us some, which right, are exactly. in balance, are intrinsically out of equilibrium and you would want to have a parameter maybe okay, that is Okay, you're encoded. asking a lot of different questions. So let me yeah. start by answering your okay. first few questions first. Um, right, of course you can go beyond all the assumptions I've made, but the, the question is whether it's worthwhile doing it uh, without boring the experimentalists too much. And the second question is, I think you, you asked whether it's pro possible to generalize this for estimating parameters of a quantum bath, right? Not Correct. Just a, Correct. So, uh, Using... Right, uh, we, we thought about it, we had a student that thought about it, but we couldn't derive nice results. But yes, it's definitely an interesting open question mm -hmm. about estimating parameters of a quantum bath. But in terms of going beyond the assumptions of stationary process or you know, Gaussian process, yes. that is, uh, 
again, uh, we could do it, but uh, if I the could result give you an example is... from quantum computing or quantum yes, devices yes. where they have been seen in experiments. It's yes, not that yes. the experiment will be bored at some point, but uh, uh, the I don't think that they are. The question is whether it's worthwhile doing it. The, I think the question so. is uh, whether we can get a result simple enough that we can write on a few equations, right? If I get a complicated result, I have to use 10 pages to write it. I mean, it, it's. On a practical level, it's very hard to uh, keep myself interested. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, Fair enough. if I get some money from some yeah. funding agency, they say you have to do it. You know, you, uh, I don't care if it's ten pages, then I'll do it. But you know, I'm mm -hmm. doing this for basic physics. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not paid by LIGO or you know mm -hmm. these quantum people. No, no, so, but precisely for that reason, the word is quantum. Noise is quantum ultimately. So that that's what oh, drives my okay. precisely for that reason. Right, um, and yeah. I haven't really. Well, yeah. I, I, I fire back your own point of view because it should be curiosity driven. Is everything is quantum? Right, yeah, I end. haven't really. Yeah. But I'm happy to, uh, to, to discuss quantum noise spectroscopy. I just called it noise spectroscopy sure. for, sure. for a special problem. So, but, yes, great questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I, this is maybe a basic question just for our understanding, but this optimality of counting photons um, is that really fundamentally due to the shot noise, uh, or is that also something we find if you do classical uh, estimation and classical measurements that, in fact, kind of you know measuring uh, in the energy of the system is, is best? Um, I mean, it's Poisson statistics. It's close to Poisson statistics. So you look at the spectral photon counting. You look at the statistics. It's close to Poisson. And then you calculate the classical fissure information is optimal. Uh, the, whether it's quantum or classical, it's very hard to explain. Can you? Can well, you? I mean, could there be a Russian 60 years ago that said that if there's a random noise, we've got to measure, I don't know, um, frequency or energy or something like that to best estimate? Ah, they, they did talk about some kind of energy measurement that I don't remember exactly what it is. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if, if they did it before. I don't think so, but. <laughs> we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Okay, so it's just a comment I want to know your opinion about. Thank you for the talk. So it's about a clash of terminology. When you, it's not yours, it's in the literature, about Bayesian estimation in this contest. Yeah, I mean, um, okay, maybe I perfectly I, understand what you're trying to yeah, ask. Okay, maybe I make clear also to the audience what I mean, right? So, you know, I mean that in this case, but you can use, in the literature, Bayesian estimation is used in, for two different, completely different problems. In your case, you use for a random parameter estimation. So the parameter is not fixed, it's random, and the prior is just distribution of random parameter. So all the bounds, the Zivzakai, and the quantum bounds that you found actually apply for this class of problem. Today I was talking about a deterministic phase. Yes, yes. I just want to make this comment, and uh, I see that you agree. It's on the right, I mean, this is the average uh, mean square error. Uh, the error that you... The error that you mentioned earlier is, is the posterior uncertainty. It's conditional on the data. But I, you know, I'm a theorist studying the average performance of a detector. I don't have the data, so I cannot, you know, unless, you know, in some central limit theorem, you know, then I can say the posterior uncertainty is equal to this average error, right? You look at the Kalman filter and all that Gaussian case, then, then this error, coincides with the posterior uncertainty. But, you know, with, without data, I cannot calculate the posterior uncertainty in general. Yeah. Because it's conditioned on the data, right? Yeah. If I want to calculate a bound on the average performance of yeah. the detector. What is the different state of the data here are generated randomly from a, a random phase. 
Yes, 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 in, yes. There, the, there's the, also the subjective this, way of describing the uncertainty, which is the posterior condition on the data. How much, you know, what is the uncertainty of? What is my degree I, I, I of think, uncertainty? I think I will object on the subjective. It's a Bayes theorem, is statistical, is the theorem of statistics, it's not subjective, it's just a theorem of probability theory. Yeah. So what it says that uh, you generate data, the data are not generated always by the same phase. Because yes. phase is a random parameter by itself. Yes. So this is what you're doing here. In the, what I was mentioning today, it is subjective probability theory. The data are always generated by one value of the phase. Yes. It's not random. Yes. It's deterministic. And the zigzag chi bound and so on, for instance, do not apply to the other problem that I was talking today. Right, but do, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard for me to care about unbiased estimators, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. And for this problem, of course, for the noise spectroscopy problem, unbiased maximum likelihood Kramer outbound makes sense again. It depends on the setting, of course. All right, I think maybe we have one, if it's quick. Uh, Menke, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, this uh, conclusion of counting photons as a better choice than a homodyne is quite uh, counterintuitive to me. Counterintuitive, okay. Yeah, uh, and uh, I find it quite hard to understand uh, intuitively because, uh, ah, okay. for example, how, how is it different than my normal photo detector detection? For example, I record, uh, I use a normal photo detector and I detect um, right, my, so uh, I can go to this slide and explain the, the signals, and then uh, and then I, I thought that I already catch all the information uh, I could. So why is it uh, worse than so? Let's than think about Michelson interferometer. Them. Let's think about Michelson interferometer. That's the simplest explanation. Random phase on the Michelson interferometer. If there's no signal, let's think about the simplest case. There's no signal. Everything is balanced. What is the output? It's just vacuum, right? So vacuum is perfectly quiet. If I do photon counting, it's perfectly quiet. It's zero photon num number all the time. On the other hand, if I do homodyne, heterodyne, linear amplifiers, think about what's going to happen. Even if there's no photon coming in, you are measuring vacuum fluctuations all the time, OK? So when there's no photon, you have vacuum state most of the time because of the random phase. So just vacuum state, there's no information. But so if you're doing photon counting, you have a quiet signal, a quiet background, in principle, zero background. And in general, you have Poisson statistics. The variance depends on the signal. If you're doing homodyne, heterodyne linear amplifiers, vacuum fluctuations all the time. So that's the the best way I can explain this. Not sure if it's making sense. Yeah, it's making more sense to me now. But uh, but from a practical uh, point of view, yes. Often you are using a relatively like a single frequency light, and uh, there's not much uh, frequency component of it. And uh, when you say that you want to spectrally separate, uh, right? Because you you have a phase modulation that is changing in time, right? Oh, so you it is a, it's a broadband signal, broadband phase modulation in general, right? So you put so it on purpose to uh, encode? You, you put the modulation on purpose? No, 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 no. The, the phase modulation is applied by nature. This is an unknown signal. Okay, so stochastic gravitational uh, wave background. So that's, some, that's something that you want to measure? We want to learn about its power spectral density. Okay. Just okay. to let you know, they, they do think of these things, for example, in remote sensing, where they, they only count single photons, because if they're trying to run, for example, a Geiger... Uh, Can you use the microphone now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. This kind of technique is used similarly in uh, remote sensing, where they, where they measure single photons rather than looking at amplifying low light level signals uh, so that they don't have all the, the amplifier noise that they, they put into the, the system. And there are, they, they can get similar signal to noise ratios counting photons as they would get, say, 100 times more power um, by, by amplifying weak 
weak signals coming in. Exactly. In practice, it's well known <laughs> since the 60s that if you're detecting thermal radiation, random field, photon counting would be so much better than linear detectors if the average photon number per mole is much smaller than one. So basically Poisson noise versus Gaussian noise. So that, 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 that is quite well known. All right, so I think we're getting to the end here. Um, I don't know if Clemens wanted to say something, or was there one more question? I just didn't. Did oh. Thank you about the question. I, I, maybe I just don't understand the physical regime that they operate in. Do they have some kind of like RMS error that causes a little bit of leakage of light out of the dark port? And if I have that leakage of light out of the dark port, because of a finite bandwidth or line width associated with my laser, I could imagine that I get spectral contamination in your detection band. In other words, um, you, get, you get sort of in the phase measurement, you get a common mode cancellation because of the Michelson interferometer, the balancing of the arms of the effect of the finite laser line width, right? But, but now if I want to do spectral separation and I get a little bit of like, like, background stuff that causes a little bit of like non-darkness out of that port. So that, you know, they do their best to get rid of it, they servo away, but nevertheless there's a little bit of like carrier light leaking out. That carrier has a finite line width. Is that going to screw up this technique? Um, it's a great question. Um, yes. Did you see the physical picture I have in mind? I like, see, yes. Like really, it's not a delta function in frequency space. Exactly. No laser I know. There, there's going yeah, to be yeah. phase noise, frequency and, and noise. Power, yeah. There's there power and no offset from carrier, yeah. Right. So, um, yes. I, what, what can I say? Of course, in practice, you, what you need to do is to make sure that the background noise coming from that average background photon number per mode is much smaller than one. Then you are limited by that, but you still win in terms of the comparison with the vacuum fluctuation. So you can think of homodyne and heterodyne as effectively adding one noise photon per mode. So if you can get all that dark count, background, photon number per mode to be much smaller than one, then you win. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah, you should, you should just, just talk to... Yes. Right, yes, but you know, these, these people are trying, so, so it's not complete, I'm not completely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, great, so I think we'll close the session there, and then I'm...